Good evening and uh, welcome. Uh, uh, my name's uh, Jane Robinson and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Engagement and Place at Newcastle University. Really delighted to see you here at the Catalyst this evening for uh, one of our series of Newcastle debates. Uh, and this evening, um, delighted to say, we're going to be having a special focus on the North East devolution deal, and in particular, how it could impact on skills and employment here in the North East. Um, firstly, if I may, just a few points of housekeeping. Um, uh, if I could ask everyone if you wouldn't mind switching your phones to silence. Um, but please uh, do feel free to, um, if you want to use social media tweets about the event and share your thoughts. And we've got the hashtag, um, uh, hashtag NEDVO, hashtag Newcastle Debates. We're not expecting a fire alarm, so if it does sound, it's the real deal. So um, please follow colleagues who will direct you to a safe exit. These debates um, really have been set up by Newcastle University to provide um, a, a forum um, to uh, create opportunities uh, to engage the public uh, with some of the um, key topical policy issues that we're dealing with and bringing together um, some uh, leading figures in, in these different spaces. And it did seem really important to us as we move in the Northeast towards a devolution deal to create an opportunity to consider um, what that could mean uh, in, in the North East and how we can take that forward. Um, I'm delighted to say um, that as part of um, today's uh, discussion, um, we've uh, brought together a number of key individuals who will be able to focus on the wider devolution deal, but also how we can ensure that we have the right skills to meet the needs of the future economy. But in particular also, how we can make sure that those opportunities are open to everyone across the region and to make the most of some of the um, opportunities that we have here in the Northeast. So um, we have got a fantastic panel uh, for, for you this evening. So I will very briefly um, introduce them. Um, uh, to my left, we have uh, Professor René Kolba, who is the Dean of Lifelong Learning and Professional Practice at Newcastle University. Um, René has a um, long range of academic experience, particularly focusing on national and international um, policy in education. We also have uh, Liz Bromley, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Newcastle uh, College Group. And again, um, Liz has um, long-standing experience both in higher education and further education. And Newcastle College Group, um, as some may, may not be aware, is not just here in Newcastle, although it's a very important um, uh, partner in Newcastle, but has seven different colleges and over 35,000 learners across, uh, across the country. I'm also pleased to be joined by John McCabe, who is the Chief Executive of the North East Chamber of Commerce, um, saving his blushes, recently voted North East, uh, the, the country's uh, top uh, Chamber of Commerce. So congratulations on that, that, that John. Um, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, obviously, uh, is a business representative body, so very much speaks uh, for employers and covers a significant uh, area across the region, up to the Scottish borders, uh, across to Cumbria and, and, and down to the Tees Valley. So a little bit larger than the combined authority um, uh, uh, that we're going to hear from in a moment, but um, bringing that voice of, of business, which I think is very important this evening. Um, and, and finally, I'm really delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Henry Kippen. Uh, Henry is Chief Executive of the North of Tyne Combined Authority, but also interim Chief Executive of the Northeast Mayoral Combined uh, Authority, and also, I'm delighted to say, a visiting professor at Newcastle University. So, ladies and gentlemen, your panel for tonight. So,
So the format for this evening is um, we're in a moment um, going to hear um, a little bit from Henry, who I hope will be able to set that wider devolution context um, for everyone. Um, and then we'll hear uh, briefly a response from uh, the panel members in terms of the opportunities. We've already had some questions that have been submitted by the public, so we will um, <coughs> endeavour to go through um, those questions with the panel. And of course, there will be, as usual, an opportunity uh, for uh, members of the audience to ask your questions um, uh, to the panel as well. So um, we are scheduled to run until 7.30, uh, so I hope that we will have um, a very uh, engaging and interesting um, debate. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Henry. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yep. So I'm going to stand up for this bit. This is literally the world's fastest explanation of the regional devolution deal um, and I'm sure we'll come back to some of the detail through the debate. So recap on the deal, what's happening when, when it's all going to happen, where we are now, how we are transitioning to a new mayoral combined authority. I'll explain a bit about what that means and then some next steps. We have a devolution deal. You can see it. It's a public thing. It's a document essentially that's written and signed by government and the seven local authorities within this region and also the North of Tyne combined authority. And it provides for a deal that unites the region across its seven local authorities from the bottom of Durham to the Scottish border. A big deal in the sense that it brings together the northeast, or at least this part of the northeast, as John would say, the northeast has many flavours and variants, but, but it brings together that version of the northeast as part of a deal that is 30 years long that has about just over four billion of investment promised within it, albeit that's likely to turn into more over the years, and will provide for a directly elected mayor for the North East from May next year. So you'll see quite a change in terms of the regional governance. And whilst we have some of those arrangements happening within parts of the region at the moment, this is quite a big deal for the region to shift into a space where we can talk about devolution and speaking with one voice, and we can do it with a degree of certainty. It's the biggest deal in the country as well, which I always like to say because it makes us look good, and indeed we are good because we're the <laughs> northeast, and it should be the bloody biggest. Okay, so that is also the start of a journey, the signing of a deal. So I won't go into this today, but lots and lots of work goes on to turn words on the page and a lovely political signature into a real thing, not least the creation of an organisation around that to deliver it. Um, we have to provide for an election. We have to do a lot of work to transition five existing organisations that are working into this space into a new thing. And we have to make sure we do that in a way that's not just the public sector going like that and doing its thing, but reflects the wider world, because frankly, this is the region's deal. It's everyone's deal. It's Liz's deal. It's John's deal. It's, it's for all of us. So actually, we start this process in a way that we hopefully mean to go on, which is about making sure that we are listening, we understand what the region needs this to be, and we can put that into a 30-year investment program to make sure that some of that is delivered. And that's the kind of thing that is going to be delivered through the devolution deal a big settlement around transport that helps us to join up the metro, bus, active travel, rail, a settlement around the economy, an investment fund which allows us to invest in things that matter to the region. Now, that's a drop in the ocean compared to what you could argue the region has lost through austerity in the last 15 years, and that's true. But what this does give us a chance to do is put some public sector investment behind things that will then bring in the social and private sectors to make a real impact over the next few years. On skills and education and inclusion, we'll come to that in some detail, but that allows us to devolve across that natural geography, adult education. It allows us to put together skills boot camps. It allows us to work with people like Liz within the skills system to ask, how can we get around the ball and make sure these job creation opportunities that we create through that investment fund are matched with a really credible skills pipeline for now, but also for the future. And then you'll see really substantial work coming through on housing, on land, on sectors of the economy like this that matter to everybody, whether you're in health and public services, whether you're in a rural part of Northumberland, or whether you're interested in getting <coughs> more tourists into our economy. There are things in that devolution deal that should work for everybody, um, and it is important that it does. Um, that works in a way that is essentially collaborative. So you, yes, we'll have a mayor, but we have to make sure that this works through strong collaboration between all of our areas. So. A mayor arrives, but he or she will not be able to land on day one and say, that's what I want and that's what's going to happen. It's all about making sure we're developing policy together. 
with our public, with our stakeholders, across our local authorities, and make sure that we are delivering in each area, again, as I said, things that matter to people. And do that in a way that is uh, all ready for me. So I told you this was quick. This is going to be even quicker. So what do we do? Combined authority, it's a weird thing. It's either a strange administrative mushroom on top of the region that is confusing, or it can be really purposeful and a very positive thing for our region. We want it to be the latter. And in order to do that, we have to do the following. We convene, we commission and deliver, we manage lots of investment, we take responsibility for making and shaping policy. So the big deal here is not just about powers and investment, it's about being able to say, where do we want the region to be in 30 years? And actually put some heft behind that. That is a huge, huge thing for this region. And making sure that we are doing that in a way that reflects good principles around spending public money, because we're good public servants, but also being really ambitious and innovative in the way that we do that. Tricky mix, but we can get there. I'm not going to cover that because it's really intensely boring, but that is our life at the moment, getting ready for all of it, making sure that's all ready for day one, and what you will start to see over the next six months, a year, two years, is some of that investment which you can see on the left, which is, I mean, don't, please don't quote me on the maths, that's somewhat dodgy in comparing apples and pears, and I'm slightly embarrassed in an academic environment to be showing that, but it <laughs> gives you a sense of the degree of investment in each of these areas, how that translates into a number of portfolios, which in essence are like subject matter areas, if you like, the areas that we will invest in, and then the early things that will come as a result of that, whether that's funding to support housing going up faster in parts of Durham, or the investment zone, which will support the clean energy industry, or thinking about transport priorities to make sure we've got bus lanes working well within our places. That will all start to come through really, really quick. And you could argue the most fundamental thing of all is the settlement around skills, because frankly, any, let me go back to that actually. I won't do those last bits, but you look at any evidence of any, even a city region, let alone a country internationally, number one thing that drives productivity, number one thing that drives future investment, number one thing that drives prosperity over the long run, human capital, end of, always. And actually our ability to not only support the delivery of skills now, but think about that as a really joined up human capital strategy in future <coughs> is where we need to head. We need your support to do that. We need to work with brilliant people like we've got on the panel, and I'm confident we'll get there with that kind of collaborative mindset. Six minutes? Okay. All right. Hope that's Thank all right for starters. Thank you very much, Henry. <coughs> so th there'll be an opportunity, obviously, to, to sort of follow up on some, some questions, um, as I was saying, la later in the session. But I think uh, what, what we'd perhaps do, first of all, is, is, is come to each of the panel members briefly in terms of from, from what we know about those opportunities uh, of de devolution. Um, what, what do you see as the, as the kind of the, the key things that could deliver that kind of impact uh, in the northeast that Henry's been talking about? And, and I guess sort of reflecting on how that, that sort of fits into that wider um, um, policy context as well from government. But perhaps, Rene, if I can start with you. Thank you, Jane. And thank you, thank you Henry, for this um, introduction of, of, of the deal. And I'll refer to a couple of, of this in a minute. Um, but I think, I think what's really, I want to start positively uh, and optimistically because I think, I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for us here to really come together. And when you mentioned co uh, collaboration, it's about the true collaboration of businesses, education employers, all the stakeholders mm -hmm. working together and really working out a, a, um, a coherent plan for the region. I, thi I think while I'm optimistic is because we have seen through some of the um, combined authorities already an extreme investment and uh, shift in terms of the skills agenda, for example. And if, if you look at the North of Tyne combined authority, we've got um, 23 million got us to kind of 47,000 <coughs> training uh, uh, placements. We've got 10,000 plus more people in, engaging with level two uh, qualifications, et cetera, et cetera. So surely if, if we've already managed that with, with 60 million per year, as, as, as the figures seem to be uh, translating, yeah and a jointly combined uh, activity we should be achieving uh, positive uh, change. I think we need to really, really challenge ourselves on the true collaboration and maximise around it all the other investments that, that are there. You, you referred to the investment mm -hmm. zone. Um, we need to think about the local skills improvement plans and the funds uh, uh, related to that. But um, so, so 
to start off, very positive. I think there's some challenges, but I'll come back to that later. Okay. Thank you very much, Rene. So, Rene uh, is feeling optimistic. Liz, how are you feeling? Well, I'm going to stand with Rene because I think this is such a wonderful opportunity. Uh, two of our colleges in the Newcastle College group are in London, Lewisham and Southwark, and everything's about, well, London's different, the London context is different, the GLA <coughs> does things differently. Well, how wonderful to have the opportunity to say the North East is now different. The North East will shape its destiny and we'll think about how industry and education and skills work together to enable social mobility for the individual but economic, economic prosperity for the place. So I think the opportunity to have funding and brains and the will and the commitment to have place-based strategy that turns the North East into a destination of choice and a place where both young people and people who wish to reskill can come here and be part of an ambitious community that sees that skills, that industry, that business really are focused on making a success of the <coughs> North East in all its seven constituent parts and has a skills agenda whereby schools and colleges and universities work together to have that great educational journey for anybody who wants to get on it and then deliver the things that we need to do to have a productive region that doesn't just produce electric vehicles, but has a brilliant leisure industry, a brilliant travel and tourism offer, so that we're not just a destination of choice for skills and opportunity, but also to come and see the beauty of the place and for visitors to come here and get to know us and then be interested in thinking about maybe moving to the northeast because yeah. a bit like moving to London, it's where the streets <coughs> could be paved with gold. <coughs> oh, I like, like that vision. So, <laughs> I, I suppose, John, not, not to kind of try and sort of cast you as the bad cop here, but I have um, a heaven for friend. But, you know, <coughs> talking often to employers, there is a sort of sense of a mismatch between what employers need and are look, looking for and, and, and what, you know, that, that sort of skill portfolio. Is that just my perception, or as, as someone who has over 2,000 members, what, what, what are you hearing from employers in the region, and, and how might the devolution deal help address that? Okay, well, um, first of all, if I can just nail my colours to the mask as well, I, I'm, I'm hugely optimistic about this. I think this and is a, you would be, this but is I just thought we needed a little bit of grit it's a, in your I, oh, I will, I will, don't worry. <laughs> I will. It's, it's a fantastic opportunity for our, for our region, this. Um, you know, publicly, I describe myself as a, an advocate for devolution. Privately, I'm a devolution nerd. And, and therefore, you know, to be to be amongst friends of a similar mind on a Wednesday evening in Newcastle, talk about devolution <laughs> is, is fantastic. Um, so, um, hugely optimistic about this. One of the things that 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 I think is enabling this, because this is a collaborative effort amongst, you know, led by Henry and his team, real sort of political bravery by politicians of all persuasions to get us to this point. Other key institutions, key anchor institutions across the region in education, in transport, hopefully also in, in the business community, have, have got us to, to where we are with this. Um, the next challenge, I guess, is to make this really relevant to people who live, learn, work and play in the region. And to Liz's point, people you know, who we want to absolutely retain in the region to build their careers here, to, to, to force, forge their own futures in our region, and to attract the best talent in here as well. You know, that's, that's, so that's, that's what's behind all of this. That spirit of collaboration, I think, is, is beginning to close the gap that you described there, um, Jane, in terms of you know, if we'd been having this conversation even relatively recently and you had an employer on the panel and Liz runs some brilliant, brilliant colleges, but you had somebody from, for example, the FE sector elsewhere, not, not your colleges, obviously, but an, 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 another, another FE provider on the panel, there'd probably be a disagreement between them as to the employer saying... Well, going forward, I think in the next two years, I'm going to need X number of people with these skills doing these jobs. And the FE provider or the skills or training provider or whoever might say, well, that's, that's great, but what we can offer you is this, and, and the, this might look very, very different. I think the conversation now would be, never mind two years, in the next 10, 20 years, this is what I as an employer am looking for, this is what we're going to build our, our, our future northeast economy around. These are the things we think we're going to be really good at. And we've absolutely closed that gap to the extent that it's barely there now 
with the, with the training and skills providers and with our brilliant FE colleges and our world-class universities in the region as well. So we, we're all kind of getting on that same page. And devolution and the devolution deal, I think, is the, is the kind of the framework that, that, that sort of underpins all of that. And that gives us this vision that we can all kind of align around and start working towards. And the key word, and, and I, I apologise now, I suspect I'll say this several times this evening, is collaboration. Mm -hmm. So we'll collaborate around that framework in order to deliver it. Because this is, it is such a fantastic opportunity. Okay, thank you. So, Rene, I think you wanted to come back on some of the points that John was making. Yeah, I, 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 th I fully agree with you in the sense that um, in 10 years' time we'll be looking at, at, at this hopefully, um, very, very kind of jointly. I think one of the things from, from our work at the moment in, in kind of shaping our portfolio of life and learning offer, re rethinking our, our offer at the university to actually include that kind of skills aspect, particular also the higher skills. One of the things we have noticed in our discussions with businesses is that big challenge of focusing <coughs> on the now because of the recruitment crisis mm -hmm. in terms of, and actually, sometimes the absence of a long-term workforce plan. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, actually, the challenge of saying, gosh, what we will need in five years' time, yes? I think, I think there are, it's not just about workforce <coughs> planning, it's also ultimately working jointly on, on really imagining what the future would look like in terms of you know, technology, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of the, the, the advancement, will be an exciting challenge, but I think we have to do, <coughs> capture that together as well. Absolutely, Rene. I, th I, think, I think you make a great point. And we, as a chamber, we, we produce something called a, a quarterly economic survey. So we pull not just our members across the region, but any, any business, any employer across the region can, um, can take part in our, our quarterly economic survey. And it's, it's kind of what, what we found in, in recent quarters does, does kind of um, make your point in that there is a sense today, in, certainly in the Northeast amongst our members, but I think this also correlates nationally because the British Chambers of Commerce, of which we are kind of affiliated to, tell us that other chambers are saying the same, is that there is a sense that things are okay today, relatively speaking to, or relative speaking to, where we were broadly this time last year, when the country went a little bit mad for well, <laughs> 49 days, to be pr very precise. Um, and the economy was literally on the brink. I mean, you know, we can't under understate how, how sort of you know, severe that, that, that picture looked at the time. So relatively speaking, today, if you'd offered us this this time last year, we would have taken it. But what we are seeing employers tell us is that they are holding off on decisions around investment, particularly in the two key things we want them to invest in. Their people, first mm. and foremost, absolutely, but also in, in plant and machinery and so on. Um, it's not that they don't want to. It's not that they don't feel it's necessary. They absolutely want to do it. They absolutely want to, do, to, 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 to make those investments. But there is a feeling that it went so horribly wrong this time last year, there isn't that level of confidence that it's not necessarily going to go so horribly wrong again in the short term. So those investment decisions are kind of on hold, waiting to be made. They, all being well, will be made because employers absolutely understand why they, why they have to. Um, we just need to see a bit of stability and confidence back into the, into the, you know, the political and the, and the economic sort of world that, we, uh, that we're operating in. So Henry, on that point, if I can come to you about that sense of planning for the future. I mean, you talked about the devolution deal as a 30-year deal, which for, for, for many people, when we're used to working on fairly short political cycles, um, to what extent are you getting a sense from national government that there's a sort of a, an appetite to allow more of that future planning for what, you know, what the future economy might look like and therefore, you know, for those of us who are involved in, in, in supporting the, the skills of the future workforce, that sort of ha making sure that we're, we're meeting those mm -hmm. needs. Is, is that something that you would see as a, an opportunity? So, a bit ACDC, I would say, in that uh, yes is the answer in terms of um, devolution endorsement for that and the idea that regions should have a long-term settlement that will ratchet up, if you like, or increase over time. So if you look, for example, at the uh, trailblazer deals that have been done in Greater Manchester and the West Midlands, they are based on, in essence, uh, freeing up of some of the strings that, that are put on funding streams across economy, skills, housing, uh, transport, the main areas. Um, 
and the sense that you could shift over time to something that looks more like a settlement for a department or a nation than, than, than the, the usual kind of funding that we get. So you can see that commitment. Those deals have been done. We in the North East are next in the queue. That was promised within our devolution deal, so you'll see some of that coming through over time here in a way that's really, really positive. The, the DC bit, if you like, or the, the, the flip side of that is that it is hard for... I think the public sector broadly, so I'm not trying to do a goodies and buddies thing here with central government, but to get out of that mindset of um, sometimes measuring things on too short term a time frame and sometimes being too constrained in terms of how we measure value. So if I look at what my homework marking looks like every five years, it's number of jobs, GVA, private sector leverage, how fast did you get stuff out the door? Nobody's saying, did you support well-being and you know self-reported happiness across the region over the last five years? No, so so it's so it's up to us, I think, to say, um, what do we care about as a region? How do we play that through into the way that we quality assure our investment fund? So we know that when we are supporting investments in, let's say, capital or revenue or skills or infrastructure, whatever it is, that it's underpinned by a value set that we care about, mm -hmm. and then make sure that we are measuring the right things and that government meets us halfway. So that that's that's not. That's our job too, as well as central government. So I think too, partly yes, partly no, mm -hmm. but we have to get there. And if devolution is going to mean anything, it means that, doesn't it? That you start to define what success looks like for yourself and you're asking everyone else to meet you halfway. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think that really um, is a, a, um, a neat segue into some of the questions that we've received from the public. And, uh, you know, we had a number of questions which really relate to this issue of um, inequalities. And you know, I think um, many of us would recognise that um, there are real challenges in this region in terms of inequalities, and sadly, um, that situation has probably worsened post post pandemic, um, and and that covers a whole range of uh, of different areas. But we know that um, we do have poor educational outcomes um, for some of our, our young people um, and, and and there are wider inequalities around health inequalities and you talked about wider well-being Henry so um, we had a specific question here around the challenges in terms of inequalities around gender pay but I wonder if um, the panel would like to just reflect on you know in that sort of context of defining what success looks like for the region how might the devolution deal help us to start of start to address some of those those significant challenges around inequalities so um perhaps if i can come to john first yeah great it's a great great <coughs> question um so we as a as a chamber have just published our i mean as recently as last week published our, our latest sort of policy platform the asks that we've got of government of opposition and of <laughs> candidates who hope to be your mayor um in in the next uh, in the next year or so um, and we've called it Stronger, Fairer North East. Um, mm -hmm. And for a long time, the Chamber's talked about Stronger North East, but we think a Fairer North East is absolutely fundamental to, to our, our long-term, not just recovery, but in terms of actually achieving this region's full potential. It's gotta be a, it's gotta be a fairer economy too. Um, devolution, obviously, you know, it's, it's, not a, you know, it's not a silver bullet, it's not the magic wand, it's not gonna fix all of that over, overnight, but what it is hopefully gonna do is create uh, an economy and ecosystem where more good businesses come to the fore, um, creating more and better jobs, as we've talked about for a long time in, as, as a region, um, and those businesses will do good work. Uh, and good work, you know, that is a, there is a definition of good work, and things like gender pay, for example, is absolutely fundamental to that. It's something that, that we are signed up to, the, the North Tyne Combined Authorities um, Good Work Pledge, we as a, a chamber are, are signed up to that. So by creating that sort of ecosystem, and also sort of helping businesses understand that actually good work isn't just something to do because it ticks a box or it looks nice on your website or anything like that. It's good for business. You know, it's, it's, you know, there is so much evidence out there that says actually good employers that, if, for example, take things like gender pay really seriously and do something about it, um, see, the, see the, the economic benefits themselves from, from having done so. So, um, so I think you know, there are all sorts of inequalities. You mentioned some of them already there, Jane. One of the things that we're really concerned about in the chamber is that today, one in uh, one in four to five of the adult working age population in the northeast is economically inactive, mm -hmm. and by that, what we mean is they're neither in work nor looking for work. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. It's, it could be long-term health issues. It could be long-term care responsibilities, mm -hmm. um, and this impacts all across 
the demographic. You know, it's not just one particular age group that, that's in, impacted by this. Um, so we've got so many people out there who've got such brilliant skills and experiences who could be playing a really active part in the, in the economy if we just open that economy up to them to enable them to do that. And again, that's part of what we're asking for is that, that, that mm -hmm. strong affair in North East that, you know, I've been to the last couple of weeks in Manchester and Liverpool at the Conservative and Labour Party conferences, brandishing this document around every politician I could find to say, we want you to adopt as much of this as, 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 as you can. We'll be making that same push to, to the candidates for your mayor um, next year. Thank you. Liz, from a college perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have to be really, really careful not to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we know that COVID has had a very negative impact on the educational <coughs> journey of some young people. But if we keep telling them that they have been failed as a generation of kids going through school or college because of COVID, they will believe that they are failures. We need to turn the narrative around and say, Cracky, you've had a hard time. You're so resilient. You are the generation that survived. You are the way we will go into the future. And I think building confidence among our young people so that where there is generations of economic inactivity, they are the generation that changes it. They are the generation that has confidence that with a 30-year deal, they can see the changes that are going to come through the workforce in terms of artificial intelligence, green and blue energy, new stuff that I'm too old to ever think about learning, but they're right at the forefront of. So I think it's really important that, that a 30-year deal is placed within a narrative of a generation that can really seize the opportunity and use education as the key to unlock the door to their opportunity to be the generation from the North East that does really well and that takes the North East with them because they actually have the foresight and the ambition and the confidence to take us to new places. And I think, you know, yes, there's absolutely been historical inequalities, but education is a leveller. And if we promote education as something that is almost a human right, let's get young people and people who are thinking about what the future might hold to into that world of education, either to open their minds to possibilities or to give them practical skills that get them into employment, either end of that scale is a real enabler to realise some of the opportunities that this deal will offer. So I think colleges and schools and universities, all of us, as part of that educational journey, have a great and important role to play. So, so just kind of building on that sort of notion of a, of a hu human right, isn't, it, it doesn't sound quite as grand, but the, the um, lifelong learning entitlement, I guess, is the kind of the current government thinking around that sort of sense of <coughs> the ability to access education. And I know, Rene, at a sort of national level, you've been involved in some of those, those discussions. Do you think that that is, is something that is, is, is creates an opportunity to address some of these challenges of inequality and to open up education for people of, of all backgrounds? Uh, or, or are there other things we need to be thinking about in the context of the debate? <coughs> really good question. I think, I think the jury is out around the lifelong uh, learning uh, entitlement. And just for, for, for colleagues to uh, uh, and, and um, panel uh, participants today, to understand what the lifelong uh, learning entitlement is. It's, it's basically the government is reforming from 2025 the funding for level four to level six um, qualifications, so college quali qualifications as well as undergraduate study, which ultimately means everyone from 2025 would be given um, access to 37,000 uh, pound worth of loan in, on, on, a port um, um, on a portal, and they could choose the 37, thousand over the lifetime flexibly up to the age of uh, uh, 60. Uh, so ultimately to encourage people to be much more <laughs> flexible, possibly not following an undergraduate program, but only a level four qualification, go back into a job and then um, possibly come later to a level five or six uh, qualification complete. Uh, um, it's slightly differently. Um, the, the challenge is that actually, whilst the sector can move, we haven't seen the demand uh, as much when the Department of Education was actually uh, talking to employers, talking to um, individuals who could be potential uh, candidates. And I think the, the, the number of reasons, first of all, 
who is going to take out the loan uh, um, is, 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 is one of the questions. The other question is we are in a culture where actually businesses are paying for your uh, continuous professional development. So it, it would require a culture shift uh, um, as, as well. Um, and, but what it does come back to is it has got cross-party uh, support. So ultimately, what it shows comes back to the point that you made is uh, even national government is trying to kind of solve that kind of problem of skills, uh, but we'll, we'll have to do it jointly. So I don't think it will be straight away an answer. I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to um, really see how, how it will develop and how the sector and also the, the demand is, is, is growing. But I think what we really need to be thinking about um, and we could do that, and we could lead in, in the, re the region as a pilot project nationally is, for me, is career advice and guidance. Mm -hmm. I think a big challenge for us is career advice and guidance. We have had um, an attempt, I think, 10, ten years ago, where we, I think we, we, we got it close to right. Uh, I think we have, we have basically underinvested in career advice and guidance. Um, we are failing to show career pathways. Um, and it mustn't start at the age of 15, it must start much earlier uh, on. And I think there are some really exciting projects driven by um, companies like Nissan having 400 uh, visits to primary schools, um, universities have outreach budgets, uh, colleges have outreach budgets, but we need to start to pull these and actually create a kind of career and advice um, campaign actually in the region. That could be one vehicle, I think, that, that could be driving us forward. Yeah, no, I think that point about sort of understanding the, the, <coughs> the options, what, the, what, few, mm. you know, what are the different roles, and, and, mm. and how do you really start that conversation very, very young, um, is, a really in, is a really interesting one. Henry, I think you wanted to come yeah, back yeah, in just, on the, uh, the, uh, that and on, and on your original question about, which was a wider public policy question, mm. it sort of got me thinking, it. so I was scribbling those, have you ever seen those, they're called circles of appreciation where you've got you know stuff you can do in the first one then stuff you can influence in the second one and then stuff you can appreciate in the third as a way of helping people or organizations to make decisions within their scope and, and actually some of what we have to do as a region is, is, is work that through because there, there is no substitute for uh, well-funded public services a voluntary sector that can stand up on its own um, an environment for economic growth that's permissive for, for business, you know, a, a, a settlement for local government that allows councils to stand on their own two feet and not have to take 30 million out every year. I mean, you, you cannot do this stuff well without the macro environment being the right one. Devolution deal isn't going to substitute for all of those. It's going to give us a, the ability to do different things and experiment and put some investment behind it. But you also need that macro environment to be there and right. And I think that gives the responsibility then back on us to make sure that that's understood. You know, we're not, we're not going to be the People's Republic of the North East with a border that stops being porous. So we have to be good citizens of the UK and the world as well and make sure we're pushing for some of those national policy changes as well. To go back to what, what Liz was saying. So I think that's really important. And in a way, you know, whilst the, the deal might not give us the ability to change those things overnight, it gives us one voice for the North East so we can say, that's what we want, and if we can speak with one voice, we've got to decide what it is we're going to say and how, how loudly. Yeah, with, with brilliant powers of ESP, you were yeah. preempted a question which was around um, uh, the devolution deal seems like it'll bring historic investment to the North East. How much of it will go directly to those public services? And, and I suppose that, the, you know, you, you've responded to that question. You know, basically, we have to be realistic, A, that the amount of the amount yeah. money that has kind of come out of those public services over, over, over the last sort of, well, certainly the last sort of five to ten years, and, and, and B, that, the you know, the... the devolution deal is, is is not going to replace those things but I did want to kind of link that to another question that we uh, that, that has been asked around this sense of you know we for for some people may um, uh, remember regional development agencies and and there's a question here that, that says that, um, that that there was just before they were dissolved um, an agreement that all policy developments would be considered through the lens of the most disadvantaged or inequalities and and I guess there is a question around in terms of the areas where 
the combined authority will have influence. Yeah. How how will how will there or will there be a sense yeah. that those policies will be considered in in terms of how you, how you yeah. can address that? So let me say something briefly on that, and then obviously the panel. But um, to blend the questions, so uh, new powers and funding down from central government, not replacing what our councils do. We are not in the business of service delivery in a way that Newcastle City Council is, let's say, um, is an important thing to recognise. So we're not there to duplicate anybody else's work or day job. We're there to add value. Second point is um, an investment fund has to be investment and not spending. Therefore, it requires a return. Often we articulate that within um, financial language. A return on investment that's direct can also be a social return on investment, can be a societal return on investment in terms of decarbonisation as well, and it, and it should be, but that is a really important distinction. So we don't have a bucket load of money we can use to replace what's been taken out of the public sector in the last 15 years. It has to be about investment that delivers a return, often with a, um, creating an asset, whether that's human capital as an asset or, or, or a physical asset. It's really important. And then the third point is... Um, your point about the, the framework that we use. So I, I can't second guess a Merrin cabinet next May, nor, more sh nor should I. That's their decision to, 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 make, um, to make what are inevitably political and, and moral and social decisions about, about how that investment fund gets spent. But if I just reflect on the north of town over the last few years, devolution deal heavily weighted towards inclusive growth. Doesn't matter whether you like the language or not, but that is essentially saying we're not just about um, stack them high, how fast can you grow the economy? We're about lowering the barriers to accessing that and, and caring about where that growth and how that growth is distributed. We've applied a wellbeing framework to some of that, done with Carnegie, good, credible piece of work. Lots of public engagement went into that. And, and I think we can give a good account of the spread across people, place and business in terms of where that investment has gone. So that, I'm not, that's not a political thing. That's from a kind of neutral point of view. That, that is what we've tried to do. I would fully expect that ethos to carry through because part of what drives this, and John talks about the impressive work that the politicians have done together to, to make sure we're all together on this, which is 100% true. And, and, a, and a lot of that comes from the intensity of collaboration through COVID that had to happen in terms of the public health response, but also you can't have an economic response that stops at the river, whichever side you, you, you're starting from. And, and you have to be a fool to not see the links between health inequality and economic recovery coming off the back of COVID. So if you had any of the political teams sat up here, mayor, cabinet members, whoever, they would say uh, very, very strongly, we want to address health inequalities in a major way through this investment fund. So I, I, I expect to see some of that coming through next May. Okay, thank you. And I suppose just kind of coming on on this, in terms of kind of that, opportunity um, uh, for, 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 for different parts of the region. We had a question around, um, I suppose, that sort of the, the geography and the extent to which devolution can help us think about some of the employment challenges that we see in different parts of the region, rural areas, coastal areas. It, it, to what extent do we think that there is a, a, an opportunity for us to sort of make sure that there is a quality opportunity both geographically um, uh, as well. So um, I don't know, is that something, John, do you, do you want to come in? Yeah, so I think, um, well, first of all, I think the fact that we've got that very diverse northeast um, geography is actually to us, it's one of our strengths and we should, we should play to it. That, you know, what are the regions of the UK can boast to some of the, you know, the the historical and cultural assets that we've got, some of the natural assets that we've got, that brilliant <coughs> coastline, that beautiful, stunning countryside, and then great sort of city life and um, and, 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 and all, that, all that goes with that. So, so I think that's actually a strength. We shouldn't necessarily see the fact that we are a very diverse region um, as, being, as being problematic. Um, one of the things that, that I say regularly to, particularly to politicians, local and national, is... For us as a business community, and, and again, a wider northeast economy, we don't necessarily see the same boundaries and borders that, that, that politicians see. So one of, the, one of the real concerns I've had about um, the direction of travel of late with, with how sort of national government you know, funds regions is that the level of competition in that. And you've, got, you've therefore got communities kind of competing 
one against the other for, for a single pot of funding. And I say to politicians constantly, businesses and employers don't work along that, those lines. We've got supply chains that extend beyond constituency boundaries, beyond council, local authority areas, even beyond combined authority areas. You've got <coughs> employees that come from across boundaries. You know, so what, what, one of the things that I think we as a, as a, a, a kind of business community can, can hopefully try and influence is that broader thinking around actually this has to be about a, a strategic plan for our region a region that encompasses those rural communities, those coastal communities, those towns and cities, um, and try as best we can to move away from that kind of, as I say, that, that sort of competitive sort of, um, um, I don't know, it's Game of Thrones, is that what Michael Gove likes? It is, isn't it? Yeah, that sort of approach to this where, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a winner and a loser in these things, and, and we've, got to, we've got to move away from that because that's not how, that's not how many of us live our lives, is it? You know, I've, I don't, I, I don't know, and I'm not asking for a show of hands, but I don't know how many of you live in central Newcastle, but you've travelled into central Newcastle this evening to have a conversation about, about this. Um, so we've got to, I think, we've, and again, devolution gives us that opportunity, particularly through the, uh, the transport spending, to join up those disparate parts of our region better than we've done before. Mm, yeah, I understand there were some issues with public transport this evening, so we're maybe not, oh, <laughs> not going to go down that well, we, we, we haven't got the deal in place <laughs> once, yet. So. Once the deal's in place, I'm sure <laughs> it, they will, it will be, it'll be smooth as silk. Um, Liz, from your point of view, I mean, obviously you have, you have seven colleges, two here in, in Newcastle, but obviously serve um, a much wider um, uh, cohort in terms of your, your learners. What, 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 mm. How do you sort of see that sort of... Um, challenge maybe of, of, of addressing well I think I think the other side of every challenge is an opportunity and building on what John said about the diversity of the place there's also a diversity of opportunity so if we think about the coastal area I'm thinking of the courses that we run in relation to subsea energy wind farm maintenance you know a whole range of skills that are teachable right here right now because of the geography and then you come into central Newcastle and you think about the hospitality industry or the you know the businesses that are in central Newcastle because it's a city and then you think about travel and tourism because of the natural <coughs> beauty because of Northumberland because of the heritage industry that we have there is such a diversity of geography that there is a diversity of opportunity and a diversity of skills now We've talked a lot about collaboration, but I think there's another word beginning with C, which is really important. That's about communication, making sure that we are providing not just what business wants, but also what the community wants, what the civic society wants. And going back to uh, a bit of a conversation a few minutes ago about lifelong learning, actually government educational policy is having to just stop and listen to what people want, T levels, have been introduced as an alternative to BTECs and A-levels. Uh, these are quite high level, uh, level three learning with work experience attached to them, but the uptake is low. Mm -hmm. And now it's time to communicate if the qualifications that we are being told to deliver are not what business, the community, the young learners, the reskillers actually want. If they're not practical, then let's communicate that and let's communicate it back to government. So this devolution deal gives strength to that voice mm. and should be listening to the community and communicating back to influence policy around education and skills provision. Uh, but I think you know, this, this diversity of urban, rural and coastal is absolutely terrific in terms of thinking about how many different skills agendas can we have and can we meet by communicating, by working collaboratively and by making sure that employers are incentivised to work with colleges to provide the skills that will build that workforce pipeline that will create regional um, and economic prosperity. Thank you. And, and if I may, just to sort of follow up on that, just picking up on another question that we've had. Y you mentioned a number of different sectors there, um, in including, including the cultural sector. And we had a question around, you know, in some of these sectors, there's a sort of, um, you know, a challenge in terms of traditionally lower lower wages. 
um, you know, and potentially a lack of awareness of, of, of opportunities in those different sectors. How important is it that we, we sort of, we, we're clearer about those opportunities and, and are there things we can do collectively to make sure that there are those career pathways into good jobs? Absolutely, it builds on Rene's point about really robust careers advisory services. But you look at Newcastle College, we've got the most fabulous drama um, facilities and theatre, uh, which build straight into the creative uh, industries that this city thrives upon. Um, we currently have a government that suggests that some of those uh, courses and topics are low value, but actually they're great for social capital, for a sense of well-being, for mental health and well-being. A, a combined authority that puts the emphasis on the place and the facilities within the place which do reach away from the STEM subjects into the more um, cultural, creative, well-being, spiritual well-being um, industries, I think are really important. And it's a really good opportunity to say, here, we value those things. We don't think they're low value. We think they're high value because they add to the culture of the place. And we therefore value the theatres, um, the the filmmaking that's going on, the young people who want to be part of that creative industry. And I'm sure that we can find financial incentives to make that a viable option. Thank you. Henry? I, I just wanted to say I agree with every word of that. And, and I hope we will see, I'm confident we will see an economic plan coming through that is not that classic sort of place blind, high GVA focused, what's going to drive our economy, but is actually rooted in place and community and culture and heritage and you know again you get some of that from the, the the tone of politics within the region it's inevitable and that's a good that's a what am i saying here that is what makes the combined authority model the merrill combined authority model i think a, a good one in that it's a sort of strange mix isn't it of local politics a bit like an rda with less money it's a bit you know it's hard to work out what it is but what it does do is bring together um, a sense of regional scale and doing things in a way that's evidence-led with what politicians bring, which is an absolute sense of what drives a local place and what matters to it in terms of culture, in terms of that holistic version of what, what, what's going on in the economy. So I, I, I think that, we, that is exactly how, how that will play out. Um, and I think it's important that it does. And actually some of our um, sort of FE provision can absolutely align really well around that, but there's also some great work coming through the universities in terms of skills for culture as well at Newcastle, at Northumbria too. So we're, we're well, we're well placed. I think. I'm sorry if I just mansplained a bit, but I was so enthusiastic about <laughs> this. <laughs> no, thank you for that. Um, We've got, um, a, there's always more questions than we, can, um, than we can get through, but I'm really keen that we do leave um, plenty of time to um, hear from our audience and give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you might have of the panel. So um, I think we should have some roving mics um, coming round. If I could ask, if you wouldn't mind, if uh, you could um, say your name and um, if you are representing an organisation, um, tell us who, who that is and if possible keep uh, focused on the question um, side of things um, uh, rather than the statement <laughs> side of things But because uh, we want to get in as many questions as we can. So we've got a lady in the pinky top at the back there. Uh, hello, Margaret Montgomery. I was thinking about the uh, gender pay gap mm -hmm. and also the pay gap between the low paid and the high paid. And I wondered why in this country we focus on the fact that it's commercially sensitive or economically not allowed to find out what salaries people are on. Um, and I was thinking, because my son works in Norway and they can look up anybody and find out what salary they're on. Now, Norway is economically successful, socially much fairer than our country. And I just wondered, what's the opposition in this country to knowing what people are on? Because I do think a lot of people aren't aware of how low paid some people are in this country. OK, so that... so. Um I can certainly say that as a, as a university, we're, we're required to publish yeah, so. a report on our gen, gender pay gap. But yeah. can I come to other panel members? Maybe, um, Henry? I, I mean, there's a really fair, fair and good question. I mean, we, 
our <coughs> public sector, so all transparent. You can find all of that online if you want, and I'm sure <coughs> colleagues, some colleagues would say the same. Not necessarily the case in other parts of the economy, though, so maybe that's a John question. That's <laughs> 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 very much. You blame him, that's what you, get, that's what you get for sitting in his eye line. Um, yeah, that, that, Margaret, that's, a, that's a, a great question. Um, so I guess, I mean, again, as a, as a chamber, we're a small business in our, in our own right. So we, we employ um, just under 60 people today. Um, we therefore don't have to publish our gender pay figures, but, but we choose to because, again, coming back to that thing about we think it is good, we think it's good for our staff that they can see, but we also think it's good for our, our members, the 2,000 odd businesses that we employ. If they want to have a look at that, they should absolutely have access to that. My salary's in our annual report, that's online, that's, that's all there. G generally speaking, why we have that approach in the UK um, compared to perhaps a more transparent, more open approach in Norway, I, I probably don't have a sophisticated answer to that other than we've, we do have an uncomfortable relationship with income yeah. in, in the UK, don't we? You know, we, if you think back to... Um, Obviously, this audience is far too young, but think back to you know the, the the days of kind of the bank manager, you know, and where you'd be sort of taken off into a quiet room to discuss your your banking arrangements with the, with the bank manager. It was all very sort of very official and very quiet and quite intimidating as well, wasn't it? Um, to to have those sorts of conversations. So I think just generally speaking, it's just an unco it's it's a it's a conversation around income that we just haven't been comfortable with in the UK. Um, I hope that one of the kind of the side benefits, if you like, of being more transparent around things like gender pay is that we'll just start to kind of relax a little bit around some of that because there's no reason why we shouldn't. Denise, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, th I think in the world of education, quite often, as James said, we have to be transparent. And I also think that the gender pay gap is less apparent in education. We can justify that quite often there will be women on lower pay scales because they will be working part-time or they will be having those support roles, but not because there are not women in very senior roles as well. I think we're really lucky in education that we tend to be quite transparent and we understand and have cognizance of where people are being paid and what fair pay is. The college sector has been reclassified really recently, so we're back in the public sector. Uh, but we were fairly transparent before that. But during this cost of living crisis, we have had such a focus on ensuring that any pay awards that have been made have been heavily weighted to the lowest paid because we absolutely see that people who are on salaries of 20 to 30,000 pounds are being hit so much harder by the cost of living, by the rates of inflation, by the general <coughs> difficulties that the economy is facing in a post-COVID and post-Brexit world, that actually that's where we're waiting any additional funding that we have to just try and make their lives easier. I have no problem with people understanding who is paid what, but I do have a real issue about making sure that when we have more money, we weight it to help the most disadvantaged in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Just interesting, Renee. I mean, obviously, you you um, you you've lived and worked in, uh, and indeed were born in in uh, another country. Any any reflections on um, the differences that you've observed internationally? I think it's a cultural thing. Yeah, I um, I remember very 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 early on when I um, I was twelve or thirteen when I first came to the UK, and the English teacher told us, "Don't ask at at lunch uh, your host family about the salary." because that's not a done thing here, yeah? And um, whereas, you know, salary conversations are very open at an Austrian dinner table where, where you would have conversations <laughs> when your uncle comes and... and, and so it's, I think it's a cultural uh, um, aspect that, that we'll have to overcome. Um, but I think, I think as, you, as you refer to, more and more professionals are actually having um, the pay scales publicly available, so you can actually uh, look at least up the pay scales, uh, you may not know exactly what pays because people are on. But mm. yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, there's a prospect of sort of discussing salaries over mm. Sunday lunch. Yeah, it's definitely a cultural <laughs> thing. So um, I'm going to take um, three three together. Um, so I've got Sally in, in the front row, and then I've got gentleman in the striped T-shirt, and then a gentleman um, on that same row towards the end. Just uh, th Thank you very much, um, Sally Young. Um, Northeast Child Poverty Commission and several women's organisations. Um, 
so we don't lose it. The gender pay gap is very bad in the northeast and getting worse. So that is a point I'd make. And following from that is the issue which Liz just pushed on. And if we look at investment as social investment and looking at things around caring, we do know that a lot of people from, I think, all the research that everyone has done um, are not able to fully um, engage in, you know, in the economy because they're too busy caring, whether it's for older people or for children. And I just wondered about the potential for looking at that as a more foundational subject. Um, you can see the, you know, the Women's Budget Group has done a lot of work about you know, getting people into work as carers, but also um, how it would enable many people to either join or rejoin the workforce and maybe not have as many part-time workers yeah. who will mainly be women. Thank you. But should we take this second question as well? Um, yeah, hi, um, I'm, uh, Eric. I'm, I'm, I'm a Northeast native. I don't represent anyone other than me. <laughs> um, I'm just curious. Um, in November 2004, uh, the people of the Northeast region were given a vote for a regional assembly. 80% said no. Were they wrong? Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, let's take those two and then we'll, we'll come back to the, this ge gen gentleman um, in a moment. But so, so. Sally, um, we touched on this earlier, this sort of you know, challenge around economic inactivity, recognition of uh, the, the actually you know, caring responsibilities, limited opportunities for, for fle flexible working. So just ref reflections on, on that. So um, maybe if we go the other way around and start with Rene this time. Just a personal reflection from Mary, yeah? Um, and and I, think, I think it's not just about um, inactivity, it's also really that kind of um, people who've got high qualifications, but they actually because of it care uh, responsibilities can't actually enact those uh, jobs any longer. Um, and I use my, my wife as an example, who is a trained nurse, but because of our two little boys has now given up that job because actually we can't manage with night shifts, etc. and me travelling international, etc. And we made a joint decision of that. So she's in community care um, and was told recently she has got all the qualifications she would be superb as the senior, uh, getting the senior post, but she's not going to get it because she can only do 20 hours. And that's ultimately, um, and I'm not, you know, <coughs> this is just an example to showcase. It's not just about inactivity. It's also about everyone in this room will be affected some members of your family will be affected by this. And I think that's, that's one we, 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 I fully agree with you, ultimately, Paul. Yeah, that's very powerful. Liz, your thoughts? Oh, well, my thoughts are in a bit of a whirl at the minute because I have a 94-year-old mother who has dementia and um, I am currently living with the fact that I'm extremely grateful that my sister is retired and I do <coughs> keep thinking, God, if she wasn't <coughs> retired, what would we be doing? And I think that the Devo deal gives us the opportunity to review the social care infrastructure, which could take some of the burden from historically female carers, mothers, daughters, nieces, whoever we are, just to put more value onto a social care system, more funding into it to relieve that burden. We know that the population is aging, so this problem is not going to go away. But on the other side of it, I think we do have employment law that... Um, should give opportunities and not put your wife into the situation that you've just described. And I think as employers, and certainly as senior leaders within large organisations, we should be saying, oh, why not? If you've got a senior job and somebody can only do it two and a half or three days a week, why not? Because I bet the value that you get out of a woman working for three days will be significantly higher if she takes that opportunity than saying to her <coughs> no and giving it to someone who is available five days a week but lacklustre. Um, I think we've got massive opportunities in the workforce, in the dormant workforce if we ask that question, why not, a little bit more openly. Mm. Absolutely. 
And I'm, I'm going to remind panel members that if you would like to respond to the other question around the uh, around um, regional governance okay. and the vote in 2004, I'm suspecting that this is primarily something that uh, Henry might want to pick up. But if other panel members would like to comment on that, please do so as well. So, um, John, uh, we'll start there. I agree with him, Eric. Yes, it was. A, it, it, I think it was a mistake. Um, <clears throat> no, I think. I think we didn't do a good enough job at the time in explaining what that opportunity was and what that meant. And I think we've got to learn from that in, in, in the forthcoming election to explain what this opportunity is, how it impacts the lives of everybody in this audience this evening. Um, I think that it is incumbent on all of us with a, with a voice in the region to, to, to kind of get behind that and to, to provide some narrative to that. But it's also really important that the candidates get into that as well and the candidates set out their purpose. Why do they want your vote next year? You know, is, is it because, as I hope, they look at a school, they look at a community group, they look at a college, they look at a business, and they, can, and they think, actually, if I'm elected to this, I can help make life a little bit better, and then hopefully longer term, a whole lot better for those organizations. So I think we've got to do a much better job on explaining it, because I think we didn't really get that right last time, and I think the, the campaign against the uh, Northern, Northeast Regional Assembly did a much, much better job explaining why not than those of us who were in favour explained about why. Um, Sally, to your point about, about inequality, yeah, everything that, that the, the colleagues have already said, um, again, just broadening it out a, a, little, bit, a little bit further, but, but still in your world, we've got, what is it, two in five children in the Northeast are born into, uh, are, are living in poverty today, and that is, you know, we're at the wrong end of that league table. There are other league yeah. tables we're at the wrong end of as well, which are feeding into that. So, for example, you know, our, our median wage in the, oh, sorry, our wage um, in the in the northeast is way behind the median average across the UK. So, this is a problem not just impacting people who are, for whatever reason, not in work. It's actually in work poverty is a real issue for us in the UK. So, again, back to the devolution deal, back to creating a better environment where better businesses can flourish, creating more and better jobs in the region. Henry. Can I be very clear, Chair, I'm not saying the public are wrong. Uh, that's democracy, that is, that is what it was. But uh, in my view, and I was living in London at the time, so I'm not, I wasn't, uh, you know. But was it right for the region to pass up the opportunity to <coughs> support its own self-determination and get on the road that we are now playing catch up on as a result? I think that probably wasn't the best outcome, should I say. Um, I, I do, however, think, g give, given what John's just said, there's a reflection, isn't there, which is if, if this version of devolution is not porous enough, if it's not enough about the conversation with the public and people don't feel like it's their devolution deal, the risk is that it founders on the same or similar rocks over time and that it won't mean enough. And, and actually, this is a a democratic construct you need to vote for a candidate for a mayor you need to you need to give somebody a mandate to to, to work with us within the region to deliver some of what we've just talked about and if nobody turns out that mandate is going to be weak so actually whoever you support it doesn't, doesn't matter and certainly i don't have a dog in the race uh, do it come out support be part of it because that's what will make it work over time and we will, we will no doubt sort of um, see the, um, the candidates and, and their manifesto in, in, uh, in the coming weeks and months. But I think also uh, events like this trying to, to sort of raise a sense of um, uh, adding to that opportunity to have a debate around what are some of the kind of key issues and, and engaging with that and making sure there is that that relevance is, is re really important and something obviously we we'll, we will we will try and support so i've got another question for the gentleman here i think you've got the mic yeah <coughs> an observation uh, chair and 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 the question and i find it interesting that that uh, we haven't heard tonight recognition of the united nations sustainable development goals somehow it doesn't seem important enough to you know, to mention, and, and we have a political challenge in the North Sea at the present time in relation to, uh, you know, e exploring and working on, on the oil industry. So for those who are concerned with the environment, I, I find it uh, a bit interesting that uh, it didn't get, doesn't get on, 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 the, on the agenda. But my, my question is that 
for me, there's a kind of vagueness around uh, uh, what the values and principles are that underpin you know, the contributions from the panel. And I've been really quite committed and interested to follow uh, what's described as community wealth building and the principles that underpin, for example, uh, the, the, the Preston model, and one or two examples north of the border, which really challenge the existing and likely existence of kind of neoliberal agenda mm -hmm. in relation to the economy. So I, I just wonder what the panel think of the kind of values that underpin community wealth building. I've got to assume that you're familiar with CLES and these organizations that have been around there for at least a decade. Okay, thank you. So, um, question around those values and principles, um, and, and I'll, I'll come to you first, if I may, Henry. I think also, um, uh, just Thanks, giving you, I'm giving you a, a few minutes to think about it, a few seconds to think about it. Um, but but, I, but I, I think also um, very keen to just sort of pick up on that sort of challenge around the UN SDGs mm. and sustainability more, more generally. Um, you know, we see... Uh, this is kind of potentially, well, really the, the biggest crisis yes. uh, facing yes. um, facing us across the globe. So um, I, I think one that is important to kind of get a view from the panel on, on what that means in the context of the conversation for this evening. Yeah. So values and principles, Henry. Yeah. So, so on, on a great question, a great observation and great question, the, on, on the values and the importance of those parts of the kind of SDG package that you focused on, so sustainability, carbon reduction, if you like, that kind of value set that sits underneath what we're doing. I, I, I think you'd find that quite high in the mix within the devolution deal. So the, the, the only thing I can give you that sets that set of values out at the moment before this new combined <coughs> authority has been created is that document, which is words on the page that indicate what, what we want and what we stand for. Um, and that is... I can say really confidently, the the most progressive devolution deal out there in terms of the inclusivity of the model and the extent to which carbon reduction and that shift to net zero is baked into the economics of the deal. So that 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 is there, and and that would be shared, and know by the political team. On on your on your point about the um, the the economic model, I suppose you could say, isn't it, and and how value driven that is. If you take if you take the, the sort of small and big P politics out of community wealth building and you make it not about a Labour run council in the northwest of England and you actually say, well, what is that about? Um, generation of more wealth within communities, recycling of wealth within a place so that's not leaking out, shortening of supply chains so that you're making sure that you are supporting local business when you have big things happening like RHS2 equivalent, let's say. Um, caring about the social impact of your investment as well as the economic impact and thinking about the role of municipal authorities or the public sector in helping to drive that through the way that they deal with procurement, for example. Um, take the politics out of all of that, and I think a lot of people within this region would share that value set. I don't think everybody would call it community wealth building, but if you look at the way that the Conservative-led administration in Northumberland is thinking about health inequalities and how that plays through into its procurement, it's the same sort of stuff. So I'm, I'm quite confident that there is a, a, a good quality value set that sits underneath the, the, the economics of the devolution deal. I don't think we need to call it community wealth building for that to be true, and you'll find candidates coming through with their own versions of that, but objectively speaking, this region needs the model to be balanced. This is not a part of the world you come if you want to stack them high and disappear, make your millions and don't care about society. Why would you set up in the northeast if that was your goal? It has to be balanced and I think that will play through in, in terms of the work that we do. So it's a brilliant question and uh, I hope that is adequate as an answer for now. We'll have to see over time but I, I think you'll find us pushing in a direction that's, that, that's close to what you're describing. John. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, Henry's given a, a brilliant answer there on, on, on um on, on that part of your, your, your question and your brilliant observation. I think just on the, um, on the part about decarbonisation and the, both the, 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 sort of, you know, the very clear, the re, you know, real and present danger of that, um, but also the opportunity for us in, in the North East as well. You know, we've got 
again, through our, through our universities and through some of the businesses that are already operating in the northeast, we've got an opportunity to be at the forefront of that. Um, it's one of the sectors that we identified in the, uh, this plan that I alluded to earlier on that we've just delivered in the chamber across the region where we're looking at kind of the, the, the skills that we have today, the skills that we're going to want for the future, the, econ the, 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 the industries and the sectors within the economy that we're going to build our economy on going forward. Um, net zero decarbonisation was absolutely front and centre of all of that. One of the things that we're asking for um, with government right now, we, we wrote um, to the Chancellor just last week ahead of the autumn statement in November um, and something that's been kind of on the, on the political agenda for a while and then it gets sort of shunted off and then it comes back again is, is the industrial strategy that we've, we've all kind of heard about for a long time. We'd like to see industrial strategy back on the political agenda um, but underpinned by an infrastructure strategy and an infrastructure strategy that at its heart, that's a really difficult thing to say, but I just realised that, uh, that at its heart is about making sure that the, the projects that we need to deliver net zero are actually prioritised and pushed to the front of the queue. So if you take, for example, grid access, access to the national grid in the, in the UK, if you want to construct, if you want to develop, construct an onshore wind farm, you are waiting a very, very long time before you can get that plugged in in the UK right now. So an infrastructure strategy will allow us to prioritise projects such as that and move more towards a kind of a, rather than have these long-term queues to develop something like that and get it actually um, up and running, move to more of a sort of a, a, a get on or get off and get out of the way type queue system for something like grid access. So in other words, if you've got a project and it's good to go and you're ready to get on with it, you can plug it in and, get, and start as soon as it's ready. You're not having to wait 10, 12 years or whatever it is right now to get access to, to the national grid. So all of that is kind of, well, that's just one example of where we think a very practical change could be made under a, 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 an infrastructure strategy that underpins and enables and delivers that wider industrial strategy, not just for the Northeast, but for the rest of the UK as well, with net zero at the top. Okay, I'm going to take, um, I've got two final questions um, uh, because we're, we're running short, short of time, but I think we've got a um, lady at the front and then second row. Uh, hiya, I'm oh, sorry, is it? Yeah, um, I'm Tegan and I know um, communication is important in making sure what gets done is actually what the public needs. I was wondering how public forums will be opened and how the public will be able to communicate to you and how you will communicate information to the public. Mm -hmm. Lovely. And so in the second row. Um, my question reflects on something, John, you said before around, and it kind of seems to me like one of the big barriers in terms of that growth is that employers and businesses right now are willing to put the investment in skills and capital. Mm. And so I guess reflecting on the wider <coughs> context of that kind of short-termism and dysfunction at national level, what are the tangible things that, that you think that the combined <coughs> authority can do to kind of make the weather for the Northeast and enable and build that trust back and partner with Northeast businesses to get that investment and people and capital going? Okay. So question around kind of improving communications, how do we engage the public more, and, and more about that kind of, you know, thinking about how employers um, are, are kind of creating those, those opportunities. And, uh, Liz, do you want to sort of start? Um, uh? <laughs> well, um, I can't answer that one because I've got no idea. So no, I don't want to start with the how do they, I think that goes to my colleagues to, to my left. But I think the notion of employers investing in skills has got to come from incentivization. If there is an infrastructure plan, yeah. and the gentleman who asked the question about sustainability, you know, really clear skills plan for blue skills, for green skills, for future skills, we know that employers want to have those investment because we also know that our young people in universities are really concerned about their futures and they want a future for themselves as I want a future for my grandchildren. So we need the deal to be incentivizing employers to, for very, you know, very clear example, we can't afford in a college to employ the people who are at the, for, at the forefront of, of green skills and blue skills because they earn so much in industry. Mm. So we can't afford to employ them to teach the next generation of workers. Mm. So we need to have a partnership in which uh, employers are incentivized mm. for maybe one or two days a week 
to work in colleges, to train the trainers, to start multiplying yep. the skills and knowledge base that ensures that we've got a sustainable curriculum in the right sort of skills that we know the community wants. So I think this deal gives the opportunity for a combined authority to say, we will invest in incentivizing our employers to work with our educational providers on the basis of social justice, which is the bedrock of the values that I think you're looking for, to ensure that we have a sustainable infrastructure and skills pipeline to take us through that 30-year journey. Yeah. Okay. And but I'm sorry, I can't answer your question. Well, Henry, how are the public going to be uh, engaged in this um, uh, devolution conversation? So there's a really smart guy called James who's sat over there who's grinning at me now, and, that, and that's his job to ask him. No, more, more, more seriously, um, there'll be... Uh, so so as, as we move towards May, there'll be quite a few different opportunities to engage in different ways. So some of them are... Some of them will be quite direct and political, if you like, where you'll have mayoral candidates who, who will be doing hustings who will be starting to talk in public about what they would like to see in the role. There will be formal processes that we have to go through as a combined authority or a shadow version of that to make sure that our budget has enough public um, interest and input into it. Uh, and then through the portfolios that are really whipped through there around the different areas, transport, skills, housing, etc., cetera, um, we will be setting up forums to engage well through all of those areas too so it's a it's a it's a mixed bag but i really hope we can do a, a good job of making it feel as engaged and porous as possible the th there'll also be some some kind of inf information transfer if you know what i mean because actually it, implicit in an election is the the need to know what you're actually voting for and what people are going to do so there'll be a whole range of material that comes out to support that process too the reason I'm being slightly tentative is because the position in time we're at at the moment is <coughs> that we, until that order gets laid in Parliament that says this thing is definitely going to happen, it's an abstract concept. So if it all fell apart tomorrow, we'd have a North of Tyne combined authority and all of this North East wide stuff we'd be talking about wouldn't happen. So we can't start going out there with a brand and an identity and... <coughs> You know, pretending we're a new combined authority until we actually are, or until the, the it, until the legal journey is at the point where we can. So, uh, as a hopefully good good public servant in all of this, we're doing the right thing in timing terms. Um, I get that that means people probably want more 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 detail and, and more of what that's going to mean. I promise you that will come, but it will have to come more towards sort of Christmas, New Year, and into the into the springtime in the run up to the election. Is that is that fair, James? Yeah. Well, and that probably, I know there are more, more, more questions, but I'm afraid we, we are out of time for, for this evening. And I think that feels like um, a good place to end in the sense that, you know, that kind of communication and engagement is exactly what we're trying to do here. So if it's something that, you know, as an audience you're keen to see more of, please do get in touch and let us know. And we will be um, developing um, new events with information on the websites. So um, uh, before we close, um, can I um, thank um, you, the audience, for uh, t uh, coming out on, on, a, on a Wednesday night and engaging um, with, with this debate? And can I also um, thank, uh, ask you to thank our fantastic panel, uh, Professor Irena Kogelbauer, uh, Liz Bromley, John McCabe and Dr Henry Kippen. Thank you.